Hi, thanks Kathleen, and thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me in the back? I'm getting pumped up, okay? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, my name is Sonia Jensen, as Kathleen said, and I'm from Union Bay. Uh, so I've chosen to name this presentation uh, the Drinking Water Police. Uh, some of my colleagues didn't like uh, the authoritative uh, title I gave them, but uh, uh, I choose to use that title because they do have a lot of authority and they are uh, next in line to uh, police officers. So what this photo is actually is um, a gate and in the background is the main drinking water source for Oslo. This gate is closed from April 1st to October 1st every year and nobody is allowed on the other side. Um, so my dream tonight actually one of the reasons I'm here is, well, personal and academic and just my passion. And I'm hoping my two worlds of Canada and Norway will be able to merge. Um, when I was telling a co-worker that I was doing this presentation, she said, you know, the Norwegian Water Research Institute said the only country in the world we should be comparing ourselves to is Canada. Uh, Canada and Norway have very similar water sources and similar water threats, but we just have a lot of different practices and histories in terms of drinking water management. Um, and what I'm going to keep trying to stress uh, is the ideology in Norway in terms of what drinking water management is to keep the raw water clean. Uh, I was just at a drinking water conference and my boss, the director of 460 staff, uh, mentioned that again and again. Uh, we like to keep the drinking water clean. No potential pollutants near the source, which means no activity near the source. And I thought, okay, you know, that's maybe our philosophy. And there was... Uh, the water managers from Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, it's the Scandinavian model, is to keep the drinking water source and free from pollution. So that is one of the main ideologies I hope you guys all walk away with. And another thing in, uh, in Oslo, there's been two new infrastructures that are opening this year that uh, we're very proud of as residents of Oslo. One is the opera. Uh, we're hoping we can uh, rival Paris for, for theater and art. And another one is the new drinking water treatment plant, which is uh, bringing in UV, UV disinfection. Uh, so I would like to extend an invitation to anybody from the Regional Water Committee who's here in the room. They are welcome to come to Norway uh, for a tour. I'm actually being trained as a guide, so uh, I will guide you myself. So. Okay. Sorry about that. people in the crowd have uh, been to Norway, been to Oslo, uh, but basically what you see here is uh, the, the bigger lake in the middle, that's the main drinking water source. It's probably about the, half the size of the Comox Lake. Uh, it feeds into the Ockers River coming down. Uh, just to the left of it is the reserve backup source, and over on the side there's another source. So there's three water sources for, for the city of Oslo, eight main rivers running through it. And the way the geographical landscape is, my boss describes it as Oslo is sitting in the drain of a bathtub. So there's a lot of flood management issues. There's 45 dams uh, just off the main source that uh, staff are constantly regulating with the snow melts, with the snow. Um, so some days you'll walk by the main river, it's barely trickle. Other days we're having to, you know, just warn residents, okay, there's quite a heavy flow here. So it's, it's, the city's a bit like this. No. Uh, what's interesting about the river, the main river coming from the main uh, sources in the middle there, is it used to be a sewage pipeline essentially until 1930. It was really common in Europe just to, same in the Thames River, just to dump sewage straight into the river or to pipe it in a little indirectly. So there was a period of 30 years in Oslo where the river was tunneled, put underground, covered up. And still, 30 years later, we're working to uncover it. So one of the directors who had been there for, for 40 years said he started his career covering up the river. He's ending it, uncovering it. So, <laughs> so these are, again, I'm not sure what people know about Oslo. Population, I guess, a little bit bigger than, than Victoria. Um, we serve also a neighboring community of about 20,000. So just over half a million people are served. Uh, we're the only water provider. Uh, just some facts and figures. So our water pipeline extends, I guess, from Norway to, to southern Italy to sort of give you an idea of the infrastructure just involved in one city. Uh, there's over 400 employees. 
well. Uh, our consumption is about a third of that of uh, the Comox Valley from what I've been reading in the papers lately. Uh, one thing I've noticed for sure, I've been back in Canada just for a week and I have a guilt complex every time I flush the toilet here. Uh, the, it's all low flush, in, especially in Norway. Um, I don't know about, much about the rest of Europe. Uh, so what, what, the, what we budget for in Oslo is 200 litres per person per day. Um, the actual usage is about between 130 and 180, and then we give a leeway budget for leaks on the system, which we've been, we've already, uh, it used to be over 30% leakage 10 years ago, it's now down to just over 20, and we're continually working to rehabilitate. Being Oslo is quite an old city as well, some of the pipelines are 100 years, they, when they were rehabilitating some of the lines, they found uh, water lines made from trees, dug out trees, so quite a different structure. Uh, people, everybody seems to be interested in cost and money. Uh, we did a quick little comparison today, and the price of water is about three and a half times that of what we're paying in Union Bay. So, but the way it's but the way it's measured is you can choose to have it metered installation at your own cost, or it's something called stipulated consumption, where they estimate uh, the amount of usage based on the size of your house. And they take into consideration your garage, whether if your garage is attached, then it's considered as part of the water consumption mechanism. If it's detached, then it's not configured. So that's how we do the billing there. There's actually not a lot of people who choose meters. It's uh, resident or it's businesses that tend to be metered. But occasionally we get uh, certain famous actors and authors calling us in and saying we want to be metered now. So. So there is a national drinking water regulation guide and it is the food safety agency that is responsible for certifying and approving of the water systems. And there's now, since 2004, there's two main components to the guide or the regulations. On every drinking water system there has to be a filtration process and there has to be a disinfection process. Uh, chlorine has been used in Oslo since 1929. Uh, that is now being phased out. There's two water supply systems. There's going to be three. Uh, the one, there hasn't been chlorine used for at least 10 years. Uh, the big one, the one that compares to the opera that's now up and running, they're just using a slight chlorine residue because it's such a new system. They just want to make sure everything's on the go, but it's virtually chlorine free in Oslo. And I have to say I taste a difference being here and being there. So. Uh, but generally, a lot of the regulations are quite similar to those in Canada. Uh, they want the water to be hygienic, clear, no prominent smell, taste, or color. Um, slightly different in classifications for a water supply system. In BC, it's, it's two households. In Norway, it's, it's 20 households. So just sort of different uh, regulations there. But the main thing is there has to be disinfection and, disinfect or disinfection and filtration. Uh, Norway also has quite a relationship with the European Union. Though not being a member, they have economic trade relationships and they also have political and environmental relationships. And one is the Water Framework Directive, which is now working to return all surface water in all of Europe uh, back to its condition as it was 100 years ago. It's quite a lofty goal. Uh, Europe's quite a diverse area, uh, but Norway has now agreed to be part of this as of last year. Uh, another condition of the, of the water, European Water Framework Directive is to return its source to the same condition it was in when it was tapped. So, this is the main drinking water source for Oslo called Lake Marsdal, uh, in a very bad English accent. Um, and what's really important about this is this is a very pristine raw water source. Um, Norway, the fundamental water management principle, like I said earlier, is to keep, keep the source clean. And it's, it's easy to do when they've had such a raw, clean source. Uh, one of the ways they believe in keeping it clean is they don't allow any activity in the area in the summertime. Uh, they also believe, just in general, in keeping nature clean and accessible. They have something called recreational law, which has been bound in law since 1967. 
and it allows for equal access to the outdoors for anybody, anytime, anywhere. Uh, which in theory means uh, you can pinch, pitch a tent anywhere in the country. Uh, and I actually did that last year, um, you know, thinking, you know, we can't just pitch a tent on the side of a highway. Well, yes, you can in Norway because of this law. Um, so there's a lot of respect. There's a lot of respect for how humans can interact in the natural environment uh, in a different way. So again, this principle, keep it clean. Uh, is, is a really strong value in the Norwegian society. Uh, also very new in Norway is uh, a bill that was just passed in April of this year to maintain water and sewage works in municipal hands. 94% uh, of citizens in Norway are supplied via public water works. Those 6% who are not are located in remote areas and it's much like waterworks that you would find Merville, Denman, well type systems. Um, some of the reasoning that was used in Parliament for keeping it in public hands was that water and sewage infrastructure is so completely vital that any sort of impact on that system is going to impact all other systems in all other sectors. Uh, another, another argument was the self-cost principle. Uh, the water and sewage works where I work uh, is not allowed to make any profit. Ever. They're never allowed a plus in, the, in their budget. Uh, we're run solely on, on the water bills. So that was the principle that we want to keep it affordable and uh, it's a very important part of society. So here I hope people can see this map okay. Uh, the green basically is what is owned by the municipal uh, water district. And the yellow is what's owned by what is a private land baron since the 16th century. Uh, the municipality and the private land baron have a very tight relationship. Uh, this has been a drinking water source since 1866. Okay. So all the green, yeah, all the green is is owned by the municipality. All the orange is not. But the, the orange is part of the watershed still. So uh, in opposition to some of the things that's happened around here, for example, uh, in fractions to Beach Creek, uh, private property in, in Oslo is not governed and monitored by a private council. Uh, in Oslo, private property is held, the owners are held accountable and have to obey the exact same environmental laws as the municipality does. So we've got the same regulations for for both landowners. Um, so there are some activities in the watershed which I will get to. Uh, same regulations for both. And there's a long history uh, of two different landowners. Uh, just the water district alone is the newer landowner and they've been a landowner there for 150 years. So uh, some of the things that uh, the municipality, uh, there's 520 kilometers of roadway uh, in the green and yellow zones, which the water district uses to go and monitor activity and, and enforce, basically, uh, all the laws. So we pay the private landowner about 40000 a year so that he clear, keeps the road clear of snow. So that's one of the relationships we have. Another one is he has a lot of fishing rights in his area that are outside of the drinking watershed. Uh, municipality buys those fishing rights and then turns around and opens it up to the public. So again, that's sort of, that's how that relationship works a little bit, so. Uh, so for example, these are, this a picture of this cabin here, it's actually a cabin for me as an employee. Uh, it, there's about seven cabins available, they're free for all employees. Uh, they sleep anywhere from two to 13 people and all you have to do is say, I want this date and they give you keys. Uh, not all of them have electricity and running water uh, or toilets, but uh, the, that's a service that's available for us. Uh, there's also, when I say forestry, there is like a, a small mill to the side outside of the, the drinking watershed that this private landowner does operate. There's some housing for his employees. There's also a school, much like the, the Sandwich School. Uh, there's also, again, outside of the drinking watershed, this is a massive area like the map showed, a lot of skiing trails. Uh, Norway's quite famous, I think people would know for cross-country skiing. Uh, there's a lot of skiing trails and there's a lot of hiking paths. So you see that there's 
even with all these activities, uh, the lake is still protected and it still supplies up to 90% of the population. Now, this, this is the fun part. So, uh, I was lucky enough to go on a, a private tour uh, with the water police. So, uh, the sign in the, in the top left corner is what you first see when you approach the lake. And it basically it says, welcome to Lake Mariano, protect the drinking water, and then no tenting, no fishing, no swimming. Um, the van is what the drinking water police the water employees drive around and the sign on the side says drinking water authority. Uh, the other photo is the picture just above one of the regulation dams and it's explaining how to protect your drinking water. The last photo is my colleague who took me around and well he just wanted to be a little famous in Canada so I said I could photograph him. So but that's they want, that is how they approach the public in those vans, uh, in those jackets with drinking water authority on their back. So while well, the Food Safety Agency sets the health requirements uh, that are legally binding, it's the water district that maintains the regulation and polices it on the first hand. Uh, so they, they police daily. And in the summer, they actually get backup from the Oslo Fishing Society because there's a lot of sort of fishing outside of the drinking watershed and there's a lot more traffic in the summer. Uh, so they do dam regulation as well, 45 dams that they're regulating measuring snow depths to see if they need to regulate more dams, fixing fences, all these kind of things. Um, what I thought was really interesting is they have the legal authority to find perpetrators to the Drinking Water Regulation Act. So, for example, offenders could pay 400 Canadian dollars if they're caught with a fishing rod in the drinking water. Uh, uh, they can also call for police backup if, if necessary, if people don't move outside of the restriction zone. And um, there's only been two incidences, actually. One where they actually did have to call for police backup. Uh, some, you know, well, I'll say youth, but it might not have been youth. <laughs> um, and another time they happened upon a couple as, you know, my mom would say, making whoopee. And they were within the uh, restriction zone. So uh, that kind of activity is not, is not allowed either in the, in the restriction zone. Norway, they make whoopee in Norway? <laughs> Not in the drinking water. <laughs> so this is this is what's interesting. So these are the some of the illegal things. The the year round is what's illegal year round, regardless. What I've labeled seasonal is there's some tighter restrictions. So for example, uh, you can absolutely never step a toe and swim. Uh, dogs either. Uh, there's no fishing. There's no ice fishing, there's no boating, uh, there's no any activity. It's According to the drinking water regulation, it's illegal to pollute drinking water. And according to the drinking water regulation, these are activities that are considered potentially polluting. Uh, Canadian geese are actually a huge threat uh, to the lake. There's a couple of islands in the middle. Uh, that's actually my nickname in Norway is the Canadian goose. So uh, yeah, I got a little nervous, but they, they do remove them. Uh, and puncture their eggs. So there's no geese in the area. Um, there are elk in the area. Any uh, animal cadavers found uh, through the ice, because the, the drinking water is iced over in the winter months, they remove that out of the drinking water area as well, as fast as possible. So there are a few uh, crop farms close to the drinking water source, so spraying and plowing. Plowing is away from the drinking water. Uh, all fertilizers are lo under lock and key. The drinking water police have the authority to go and they do monitor, make sure it's all locked up. Uh, there's no campfires. Horseback riding is way far away. It's in part of the skiing trails, hunting, skiing, all that. So basically there's no, you can't get within 50 meters of the main drinking water source. Um, uh, you can in the winter months when there's ice on the lake, so that's considered a barrier. Uh, other than that, the gate is shut, like I showed in the first slide. There's a gate. So, so uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, and this is maybe uh, what my life is, uh, trying to find uh, the similarities and differences between Canada and Norway. And what I've come to in terms of drinking water is, in Norway, it's 
one of the values is that recreational law that's been in law since the 60s, which means it's been a part of society for far, far, far longer than that. And they just value such a pristine nature, such a good quality source. They really want it accessible to absolutely everyone. This includes beachfront property, all these things. Uh, you can easily see in Courtney, that's a lot different. You can see that around Comox Lake. You can see that with Beach Creek. You can see that with the logging. You can see that with the expansion of camping. So right there, you see a difference. Um, and also, there's a, there's a history in Norway of having water police. I, it's considered one of the creme de la creme jobs where I work. And there's just no way you can get in because everybody who does it, their grandfathers did it, their fathers did it, they do it, their sons will do it, their daughters will do it. There's just no way. There's a long tradition of, of guarding the drinking water like this. And Courtney doesn't have this history, it doesn't even have a, a sign saying that the Comox Lake is drinking water. So it's quite a, it's quite a different history, quite a different tradition. Uh, I know Vancouver has water police but are only present in the summer. Um, so I, I did have a discussion point, I don't know if we should wait until after Jack is presented or if I should bring it up now, Jack? Yeah. Um, so well yeah, I guess that this is that was basically my point is I know in 2006 there was a risk assessment done to Comox Lake and it identified road transportation, uh, intentional harm, recreational boating and fishing, cabins, camping in non-designated areas, wildlife in the watershed, waterfowl, logging, yet there's an expansion to redevelop the Comox Lake campsite area, which would see it going from 17 to 38 full service sites. So such developments, and I'm you know sort of ad hoc quoting, uh, such developments will, according to Cumberland Mayor Fred Bates, improve the safety of the watershed and not diminish it. This was in the May 2nd issue of the record. I read it from Norway, furious. So I think, you know, how, how is that so? Um, and, you know, and I think this is where we can start to learn a lot from each other, maybe from places like North, probably other places in the world as well, probably other places in Canada. But I think that's an important point to, to look at. This last slide, I think, is a good stepping off point, and that's where I would like to end, actually. Thank you.